This is the place to find yourself. Istanbul offers great universities and the lifestyle is really amazing here. So I live at the dorms at Maltepe University and I'm really happy with it. There's a cleaning service every few days and then there's the library nearby which is open 24-7. My first impression when I came was like, it's huge. You have everything in one uh, place. When you first come to multiple university, you don't know where what is and you're like, oh my God, I need help. Guess what? You're not alone. There is the international office people over there. They're like family. They're very helpful and they're always there for you. Istanbul is the perfect mixture between ancient and modern. Coming into this city helps me discover myself, learn about so many different cultures, learning about the world, which will help me in writing future books. At Maltepe University, we have a lot of research centers. Because of that, we have the ability to participate in a lot of international projects. Here at Maltepe University, the education consists of both practical and theoretical. We get the opportunity to practice everything we learn in class in real life. So after we graduate, we have a degree and we can work all over the world. People come to Istanbul all the time, but what they really miss when they visit are the antique shops, which contain a thousands of years of memories and also a thread of the modern future. I like to use every minute and just get out and hop on the ferry and just um, go from the Asian side to the European side and just enjoy the wonderful weather with the wonderful Bosphorus behind me and just enjoying the moment of Istanbul. Istanbul is a very beautiful, with great culture. This city is the symbol of diversity. Come and study at Maltepe University. Come here and feel like you're home. Good morning everyone, it's Hilal. I will be the moderator for this session and welcome to the first session of the last day of our Congress. If you have any questions about the presentations, you can write in the comment section. When the presentation is over, I can forward your question to the presenter. I may pronounce, mispronounce your name, I apologize in advance. We start today with our first presenter, Alexandra Dovink, Marcelina Volos, and Maya Mrozek. We'll talk about exploring the eucalyptus. Now let's see it from them. Good luck. Hello, Hello everybody. My name is Maya. My name is Marcelina. And my name is Alexandra. We will uh, share our screen right now and just start the presentation. Okay, I think it's visible. So the topic of our presentation is exploring the eucalyptus. And we will present it um, for you today. We are from Krakow University of Te Technology from General Building Structure Science Club. Well, we will talk about the eucalyptus and here is our plan of the presentation. So firstly, we will uh, present to you the existing state of the eucalyptus. Then we will try to uh, focus on the scale of the problem and the reasons behind this problem. Then Alexandra will talk about the eucalyptus 2.0. And uh, the last part of our presentation will be the comparison to another cities with similar problems. And uh, Martina will present Szczecin City and I will present London City. So the research. Alexandra, I think back to you. Oh, actually, back to me. <laughs> oh, back to Marcelina. I'm so sorry. Yeah, but it's not a problem. Okay. So uh, the research took place in Athens and it was partially done uh, in site because we were actually able to go there uh, last fall during our Erasmus exchange. Uh, but the other part had to be done online because of the um, coronavirus measurements, as we all know. Um, and the topic of our interest was um, exploring the eucalyptus, which is uh, the courtyards of uh, Polykatokias. And Poly Polykatokia is a typical multi-story uh, building in Athens, which is seen all over the city. Um, 
and we can we can go next slide, please. Um, and we took we chose a piece of land from Omonia Square to Victoria, uh, and uh, we analyzed the structure of it. Uh, and as you can see on this um, map, the red parts are the uh, eucalyptus, the topic of our research. And um, looking at numbers, you can see that actually the public spaces for residents is not enough. It's only, um, wait, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> uh, it's approximately uh, 7.8 HA, which doesn't um, respond to resident needs because Greek people especially like spending time together and they enjoy being outside. Um, and uh, can we go to the next slide? Okay, uh, so yeah, there is the localization. Uh, study area was approximately uh, 59.35 HA. Um, and uh, in this area, the buildings mostly put polykatakias to take over 64% of the whole area, which shows that the uh, <clears throat> building structure is very, the building density is very high in Athens. And um, we were looking for the solutions to um, provide more public spaces or semi-public spaces for the residents. We can go next. And uh, this analysis through um, Google Earth shows that in some places it's still possible to arrange the, the space. Um, and in some it's so tiny, so narrow that it's basically impossible to do anything. Uh, and in further slides, I think we have some photos from the site. Uh, no, still Google. And here on the bottom, especially, you can see that sometimes the the backyards are so small that basically there's no light in the flats. So I think it's especially needed for people to have some spaces to enjoy the sun outside. You can go further. And here are the photos that we collected. And it shows that spaces are very neglected and contaminated. Uh, there is not much going on. And actually only the people living on the um, first floor have access to it, uh, but the the backyards are also divided by, by walls, and the reason for that is uh, problems with property law and property lights, which are not so clear and understandable in Athens. And you can go further, I think. Yeah, and this is actually one of our, the first solutions that Alexandra will tell about. Yes, exactly. When we noticed this problem and uh, this area, we tried to research some projects and initiatives made in Athens because um, made in Athens. And we found some smaller architecture and urban projects made by um, independent architecture studio. Uh, but we also found this actually strong concept, Eucalyptus 2.0. And uh, it's um, uh, this project actually focused on this rehabilitation of the eucalyptus. Uh, it's been initiated by architects and also a um, multiple platform, um, which aim to facilitate citizens' uh, initiatives. Uh, the, the, the main um, reason of this project is um, turning the inhabitants' eyes uh, backward uh, to uh, what they have been left uh, behind their homes. And uh, the first stage of this project uh, was the call for participants. Uh, the architects asked the inhabitants of the urban blocks uh, to um, gather together with the aspiration to change the eucalyptus. And the application came from the whole Greece. Um, so it's like, like a co confirmation uh, that the role of the eucalyptus playing a Greek uh, society a uh, big role. And now it's actually the second step because uh, this project is uh, ongoing. 
And uh, this step um, is uh, mostly for the architectures because they try to um, focus on the main and um, the most interesting ideas which came from the inhabitants and try to create like a, a plan and to um, uh, to identify the blocks and um, and to um, uh, collectivize the discussion about it. And um, maybe the next one, uh, yes. And maybe in this part of presentation, we want to show that the issue we are describing is not only the Athens problem. Many countries struggle with the problem of neglecting and abandoned court courtyards. Uh, we want to focus on two different cities and two different countries, the Polish Szczecin and English London. Uh, the authorities of these uh, cities are completely different, but we want to show the two different but interesting ways of dealing with this problem. For us, the problem is the closest in Poland because we came from Poland, so we know what the situation looks like inside out. Uh, yes, and um, in Poland, uh, it's the uh, there is the city in the northwestern part of the country. It's Szczecin, near to the sea. And uh, maybe the next one. Um, yes, thank you. And uh, in recent years, there was the program Green Courtyards, um, uh, which um, um, focused on that, that they get money uh, to the residents and the residents arrange a new space together. Uh, this program helps not only the appearance of the internal courtyards, but also help the neighborhood, ty neighborhood ties. Uh, because the um, inhabitants arrange the space together and, um, and they became more familiar and um, they, thanks to this, they wanna will you, uh, they want to use it. And, uh, yes, there are some examples of courtiers after transformation by the neighborhood community. The main changes that they made, uh, it was the playgrounds for the children, uh, organized a green complexes with uh, a permanent elements of the small architecture like path um, and uh, the places for rest and recreation. And actually, we believe that uh, such a changes um, are really important because of the society reason and also um, because um, the, the contact with the neighborhood, it's really important. But also in the city, there is the lack of the places to spend the um, time outside. So it's a really nice uh, initiative. So the next one is mine, this is London City, and uh, the other idea of development of these courtyards uh, is found in England, uh, in the city of London. Uh, here the inhabitants especially appreciate when they have good weather, we all know that they don't have it all the time, so they really enjoy uh, the open air re restaurants. And uh, these courtyards are the opportunity to have this open space without any bad weather conditions. So we don't have wind inside, only the rain can um, disturb us inside. So um, I will show you some examples how these London uh, courtyards are looking after the transformation into restaurants. And as you can see, we have a lot of tables, a lot, a lot of greenery. They are arranged in a specific style. So having these restaurant tables outside is not shocking to anybody because a lot of cities are using these courtyards. So especially, I think, after the coronavirus, we will really appreciate the opportunity not to be inside, but to have this open air and feel a little bit more safer than inside with strangers. So um, they, as you can see, are very, very narrow and very cluttered. But I think this is a good start just to explore the possibilities to 
for this concept. So you can see this transformation if you compare to this Greek eucalyptus that we showed in, at the beginning of our presentation, this is a completely different world. And I think this is one of the um, better solutions for the city centers because then they are used to having visitors, they are used to having tourists, and they also need some space for themselves and having a restaurant inside is a very, as you can see, nice aspect. So we would like you, we would like to thank you very much for your attention. And we hope that this presentation maybe um, encourages you to do something in your own neighborhood and uh, explore the possibilities and solutions for your neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I just throw something that uh, our conclusion was that it doesn't have to be like whole project on the whole city, but it can be bottom up in initiatives from residents of the buildings that can change the area of our living. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank you for girls your presentation and participating in our Congress. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll continue our session with our next presenter, Nikita Sharayev. We'll talk about identification of network intelligent features by machine learning methods. Now let's hear it from him. Good luck. Hello, my name is Nikita Sharayev. <clears throat> uh, Dear colleagues, I uh, present to you attention uh, part of the topics uh, detection of uh, network intelligence features using the discussion tree model. The report was uh, prepared by, I am also said, Nikita Sharaev, master student mm -hmm. of Belarus State University of Information and Red Electronic. Uh, so let's get started. Um, sorry. Uh, before diving into the solution of the problem of uh, detecting network traffic anomalies, um, you need to understand what network uh, intelligence is. Uh, network intelligence is a set of methods of obtaining and uh, processing data about an information system and resources, um, information security tools, and software used. From a technical standpoint, uh, network intelligence can be carried out uh, at the second data link, uh, the third network, the first transport, and the seven application layers of the OSI model. Uh, conducting network intelligence at uh, layers two of the OSI model is um, pointless, and uh, at the application layers, uh, it's difficult due to the large number of protocols and service. This is the only possible uh, universal methods for conducting network intelligence is scanning of the, the third and the first layers of OSI model. Uh, service information transmitted in the layers uh, contains IP address of information system, open transport ports, and information about services. <clears throat> to solve the problem of uh, detecting features of network intelligence, machine learning methods are used. So what is machine learning? Machine learning is a set of mathematical, statistical, uh, and um, computational methods of uh, developing algorithms that can solve a problem not in a direct way, um, but based on finding patterns in a variety of input data. Uh, there are the following main classes of machine learning methods. Uh, supervised learning, uh, unsupervised learning, and uh, reinforced learning. Uh, the first two classes are suitable for problem under study. Nevertheless, usually uh, unsupervised class trains show little uh, efficiency, but um, allow you to see uh, possible uh, patterns. Um, 
However, the task of detecting signal of network intelligence requires uh, maximum accuracy. For this reason, a supervised class is used. Popular supervised learning algorithms are uh, logistic uh, regression, uh, quadratic uh, discriminant analysis, um, support vector, vector classification, uh, key uh, nearest neighbors classification, uh, naive bias classifier, um, discussion tree classifier, multi-line perceptron classifier, and multi-line perceptron classifier. Additionally, algorithm for bagging and boosting, adaptive boosting, will be applied. Uh, since the class of supervised learning is selected, it's necessary to find a suitable uh, data set for train the algorithm. Uh, the following data set were found online. Uh, network uh, intuition detection, UNCWNB15, uh, 2019, uh, Trade Micro CTF wildcard 400, and Kitsuma network attack. Relevant to the data was also found on the um, website of uh, Larbor and New Brunswick universities. However, the data sets are used for detecting network traffic anomalies and cyber attacks, um, not network intelligence. Before it's uh, decided uh, to create our own data set is uh, currently in closed access, but I hope it will be uh, published soon. This data set uh, consists of the metrics um, present uh, on the other slide. Um, the last metrics in the event flag, good or bad. Uh, as you can see, all metrics are relevant, uh, which allows you to shape the uh, context of event. Um, the data set uh, was uh, received from network show on the slide. Uh, one minute. Yes. Uh, a test segment uh, was allocated in the corporate network. This uh, allow us to create relationship, uh, background traffic and attack. Also uh, two attack hosts uh, were created with Linux and Windows operation system. Um, host with uh, Windows operation system use uh, an map utility. Uh, to scan uh, from the Linux operation system, a uh, scan was carried out using the uh, mass scan utility. At the same time, the Linux OS was uh, configured to be able to carry out uh, an idle attack. Event were collected um, on a test server using a specialty design monitor tools. This tools is uh, writing in Python version three and automatically convert the collect events into sets and write them uh, to log file. Uh, as a result, 250 network intelligence events and uh, 750 legitimate events were obtained. The result that set is visualized, uh, visualized on the slide using the PCA methods. Uh, you can see it in finger five. Uh, I give five uh, difference the data sets by three numbers. Two of the set uh, represents the separate legitimate traffic and network intelligence. Uh, the third set is um, of interest because it's not clear separation between anomaly and uh, normal use traffic. Uh, presumably, uh, it's um, UDP traffic science analysis of the numerical indicators of the data sets showed a slight difference between bad traffic and good traffic. This should not create a um, classification problem. <sighs> uh, next, uh, the select algorithm are trade. In the case, the data sets is divided into training and test samples. Uh, the uh, train samples include 800 events and the test samples contain 200 events. Uh, it should be noted uh, that it's the train and its test samples, the ratio of bad events to good events in 25%. Algorithms are tested according to the parameters of 
uh, acquires and learning speed using various uh, hyperparameters. Так. The training are presented in the next two slides. So the first, second. Um, uh, the discussion tree with hyperparameters criteria equal genie and splitter equal random algorithm showed the maximum accuracy, um, 200, uh, 100, and speed of training. Hmm? Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> this algorithm is visualized and presented on the slide. If you uh, look at it carefully, you will note uh, that the main parameters for detecting signal of network intelligence are radio count, uh, radio TCP, uh, radio unique, radio TCP other, and uh, radio MIMON. Using the rest of the dataset parameters uh, in the algorithm is um, rudent. Additionally, the um, performance. Um, Additionally, the performance of the promising algorithm has been improved. However, the speed of the training and testing is low the discussion tree algorithm uh, with parameters genie uh, equal uh, and sp splitter equal random. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, the programming code, uh, hard code of the uh, redirect three was carried out. As a result, testing speed has doubled, uh, but the flexibility of machine learning has been lost. Uh, actually, the results are present on the slide. Due to the lack of uh, suitable datasets, a new relevant datasets was uh, generated. The dataset was created ba uh, based on the following metrics, uh, total light of the IP packets, source IP address, destination IP address, uh, source and destination ports, request type for TCP. Uh, based on the dataset, the classification of the features of network intelligence is carried out. Um, all presentation methods were trained and tested using various hyperparameters. The best result uh, were shown by the discussion tree methods with parameters creation equal genie and splitter equal random. Additionally, uh, individual algorithms were improved using uh, backing and boosting procedure as um, well as the presentation of the algorithm with the best parameters into the form of the programming code, hard code, which made it possible to increase the speed of um, network by approximate in two times. Oh, it's all. Thank you for attention. I would like to thank Nikita for his presentation and participating in our Congress. Thank you, Nikita, again for your presentation. And now we'll continue our session with the last presenter, Tanya Swaminathan, Ritim Goba, and Kushi Parekh will talk about binge eating, a hidden illness among teenagers. Now let's hear it from them. Good luck. Thank you. A very good morning to all. Hope you're doing well and keeping safe. Uh, we are four year students pursuing Bachelor of Design in Humanizing Technology at NMIMS School of Design, Mumbai, India, and we're honored to be a part of this conference today. Our area of focus during researching in the domain of food and related habits was binge eating, something you don't commonly see as an illness based on a single instance. Around 20 million Indian teenage girls suffer from eating disorders. Uh, as you can see, 89% of them suffer from stress and 37% of them indulge in food that is high in calorie. Various methodologies and persuasion techniques have been used within the health sector to uh, help people in developing new habits around health, from making them uh, have better eating choices to encouraging them to have a more active lifestyle. Organizations and therapies are one of the most common ways to address this issue as a lot of people connect to them and common environments. However, uh, these are not very efficient as people uh, don't like others knowing that they're suffering 
and hence the numbers uh, that turn up to these organizations are very less all these ways to curb uh, binge eating eventually boil down to self monitoring which loses the eff efficiency of the purpose over time so what exactly is binge eating disorder and when does it become an issue when one consumes large quantities of food than usual in around 2 hours they feel like they and they feel like they lack control over their eating habits that's when it's something to be worried about uh, this habit of binge eating is practiced weekly for a period of 3 months um, and then it converts into a disorder eventually so based on this the study aims at inducing mindful habits among the female teenagers who binge eat on unhealthy food so as to prevent the habits from converting into a disorder over time since eating disorders impact the overall health of the individual as well as the quality of life such as like emotionally physically mentally and even socially we aim to curb the problem at an earlier stage over to you kushali uh thank you so after understanding the underlying problem it had to be further analyzed in order to come up with solutions to be able to combat this issue so initiation of understanding the depth of the problem was done with the help of empathy interviews wherein we had 52 participants and uh, these 52 participants involved 30 college students four bloggers four working mothers canteen chefs uh, professional chefs and restaurant owners and the ver the varied range of uh, these participants helped us in uh, enhancing the understandability of this research uh, after evaluating the research and gathering these observations, uh, we boiled down to having teenagers aged between 17 and 22 years for the final research study. Uh, and further, several design tools were used in order to collect and synthesize the necessary information and data for the selected topic. And wherein we had to go through four phases. We started with the research and then we went to uh, grouping all of the data that we had got from a desk research and mind maps, which we later on went to conceptualization uh, to give our problem a proper direction to work towards and produce low fidelity and high fidelity prototypes. And then finally test it with the users in real life by asking them specific questions. Um, so coming to our results and discussion, we empathized with about 10 uh, users aged 17 to 22 and understood that almost seven out of 10 of the, these uh, teenagers lose control while they're binge eating and later feel guilty about it. So the major insights that we had found were that uh, women are more prone to eating disorders in comparison to men since they are more concerned about their own body image and have susceptibility uh, to body dissatisfaction and get conscious due to their diet and uh, they, they, got, they get conscious of their diet due to the societal standards. Uh, body dysmorphia goes hand in hand with uh, the, eating uh, the eating disorders. Uh, also, in spite of diet plans and weight, train manage weight training management facilities, uh, not many of them avail them as they are not aware of the issues that they are currently facing or do not see a problem in their diet or lifestyle. People usually approach these professionals at a later stage of, li of life when the disorders are prominently seen. Since uh, we see in India that disorders related to food are not considered as an illness or anything negative due to the stigmas attached to it in the society. And also that external help was not considered in most cases, again, due to the stigma in the society and the fear of judgment that the teenagers had. And they did not want to face that along with the college stress, which they are already going through with. So after establishing the intensity of the existing problem, we came up with a solution called MapMe. And MapMe was designed to curb the binge eating habits among uh, the female teenagers. And it is a system consisting of a mobile application and a wearable that will help them realize and reflect upon their actions and will eventually bring about a change in their lives. The wearable keeps track of the binge eating session of the person throughout the day and generates eating patterns simultaneously. So now Tanya will continue with explaining how exactly the system works. Over to you, Tanya. 
Uh, so for the variable to function as accurate as possible while tracking the user's eating sessions throughout the day, we have used three main components, uh, an accelerometer, a battery cell, and a vibrating motor. All of these are fitted into a tiny rectangle of one centimeter width and two centimeter length. This small rectangle will be placed in the wearable's bottom side that touches the user's inner wrist and the top part of the wearable will be consisting of adjusting mechanism to accompany to the size of the wrist. Moving on to the mobile application that will work along with the wearable, the MapMe app will take in details of the person like name, age, gender, weight, height, and meal timings to keep a daily log of the user's routine. It will be synced with the wearable it, uh, via Bluetooth mechanism, and the app's interface works towards building a personal connect with the user and aims at helping the person to break their habit of binge eating and choose a healthier option. Uh, a, user a user test was also conducted for the design system to know where it stands in the said person's daily life. We conducted three sessions, each of 35 minutes long, with three real-life participants. Each participant had to give an expectancy test, a scenario-based test, and an overall rating for the entire experience. On an average, the application was given a 4.08 rating out of 5 and was thought of to be very uh, really appealing in their daily routine. To conclude, uh, the MapMe system will be developed, will develop healthy habits uh, on the longer run while being propagated amongst teenagers and their families as well as other uh, channels of socialization. We also feel that when one starts noticing changes in their eating behaviors, one should start reciprocating and reflecting upon their actions. It is always beneficial to prevent further damage than to cure what damage has already been done. Thank you so much. <laughs> I would like to thank you girls for your presentation and participating in Congress. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm concluding our Congress sessions for today. We will have a break before the second session of our Congress. Uh, break is until 1 p.m. in Turkey time. Thank you for joining us. See you at the second session. Take care. <laughs>